And so we set out to explore with Freddie Clayton and Sonia Smith, as well as Margaret Courtney Clark, what was going on? Was it a localized issue just in rural areas? Was it a larger systemic issue across the country? Who was responsible? And how could Namibia catch up, not just to its neighbors in Southern Africa, which it was lagging behind, but in the world? In fact, Namibia ranked number six in the world for open defecation. But I want this story in mind as we begin. So now let's go to tips for reporters. The number one thing I always say to reporters I'm working with is who are the humans you're talking to, right? Who are the people who are going to be at this story, whether they're the people directly impacted by the issue or that they're the experts or officials who are actively involved in addressing it, correcting it, or even, frankly, denying that they're involved at all. And so for this, I like to divide it up into authoritative sources and non-authoritative sources. Ultimately, you want far more authoritative than you want non-authoritative for pretty obvious reasons, I think. But just to review briefly, these are the people who are speaking about their own lived experience. In the case of Namibia, these are the people who lack adequate access to sanitation. And one of the things that Freddie and story is that a lot of these people didn't just live in rural areas where many suspected that the open defecation rates would be higher, but they lived, in fact, in the informal settlements outside of the major cities like Vintuk and Swakamund. And part of why that was the case is that a lot of the folks from rural areas were migrating to the city. The city could not expand fast enough to accommodate them, and so they would create up these, these informal settlements outside of the city. But those settlements lacked basic infrastructure. They lacked sanitation. And so many of the issues they encountered in rural areas, they were now just encountering a more urban setting. So Freddie and Sonia actually interviewed over 50 people across the country, get, gathering those experiences from as young as 15 years old to as old as 100 plus, because they were trying to show that it was indeed a systemic issue. It affected people. And the government was the key in all of the storyline. They also spoke to representatives of the community being written about. So particularly in the rural areas, the leaders, even headmistresses of schools that often could speak for the collective experience of inadequate sanitation. And those can be really good too. Sometimes you may struggle to get certain people to go on the record with you, particularly on highly sensitive issues. But leader or even an elected leader in that area, they may take the initiative to do that. There's also the element of this. Now, we think about eyewitnesses when we think of a breaking news story. A crime has happened and there's been an eyewitness to the crime, but there's witness to systemic issues. And I mentioned the headmistress a second ago because she was in rural Kavungu East, which is a part where rates exceeded 70%. And her particular school in it, and she was noticing how a lot of the girls were not showing up to school because there was no bathroom. And even when she raised the funds within the community, there was still only one bathroom for 150 girls. So whenever they were on their periods, they wouldn't show up as to the kind of larger problems that were created by inadequate sanitation and by a government that was failing to provide. Now, of course, I mentioned the government multiple times. And so another authoritative source is obviously going to be on the other issues, right? The accused. Everyone sort of pointed fingers at the government. No one could point exactly to which government official was to blame or which ministry was to blame. And this is going to be a part of the storyline as we move through Namibia, that it's actually quite complicated. But Freddie and Sonia had to go to the Ministry of Health. They had to go to the Ministry of Agriculture and Land. They had to go to the Ministry of Urban and Rural Development. And they had to interview as high level a person as they could about why these failures were happening across the country. There were also the authoritative um, experts who I call the subject practitioners. In this case, they had a UNICEF rep who was actively involved in a lot of these communities trying to provide uh, education around sanitation, but he understood very clearly what the health risks were in inadequate sanitation, the diarrhea outbreaks, the cholera outbreaks, and could speak to the health implications in addition to the education component. Now, Freddie and Sonia didn't have as many non-authoritative sources, which, as I said, I think is okay because you want to obviously lean in heavily on your authoritative. But there may be instances where having some non-authoritative sources makes sense. So, for example, someone who wasn't directly witnessed but heard about it <laughs> from someone who was a direct witness. And there are many reasons why someone who maybe has witnessed something wouldn't want to go on the record. So sometimes going through a second party is more helpful. There could be someone you're writing about in your story if you're implicating a particular person or company, and there are people who can shed 
past because they're related to them, because they're an ex-wife of one of them, et cetera. So they can provide a certain amount of color. And then there may be the people who have tangential knowledge. So they're not subject area experts in the, you know, the health effects of inadequate sanitation, but they have dealt with their fair share of cholera cases over the years. And they so again, you want that balance, but you really want to lean heavily into your authoritative sources. And in the Namibian store, about 50 of them. So the challenge, of course, vet them. And while the editor will end up doing vetting on his or her end or their end, you have to do the vetting as a reporter. I always say, have you background check your sources? And what, what do I mean when I say that? I don't just obviously a fair place to start, but have you looked at all of their social media channels, right? If they have any, there are written about them. Have they been cited in any sort of research? Do they have their own websites? If they're officials, they probably have a government profile of some kind. If they work for major companies or corporations, a story like Namibia is that a lot of the people that are being interviewed are local people who live in settlements, who live in rural areas, who may not have smartphones, who may not have access to electricity, who may not have much of a... So the question of how you vet them is quite serious. And this is where I say you wanna to go to question number two here. Have you asked for evidence to substantiate their stories? What sort of evidence? Now, Freddie and Sonia... And a lot of the evidence they gathered, they gathered with their own two eyes. So, for example, they would review a married couple who said that people were basically openly defecating in their backyard in an informal settlement, and Freddie and Sonia would witness it happen themselves. The headmistress of the school, who would show them that on an average day, attendance at the school was down 60% because the girls weren't attending. And when they would follow up with the parents of those girls, they would find, in fact, that they were challenges to not having access to a bathroom or to being embarrassed around it. They would talk to people who had been robbed at night while they went to openly defecate in what they thought was a safe area, but weren't actually going to openly defecate at all and had buckets in their little shacks that they would use at night in place of going out. So there were various kind of visual evidence. And because Margaret, our photographer, was there, she was able to capture one of the big parts of the story, too, was that the government would sort of plop down toilets and then leave. And there was no main education of the local people as to how to maintain and manage. And so a lot of the visuals were also, oh, here are these two toilets that no human being would ever possibly use once you see the insides of it. And they would be shown that. So you really want to the people who don't have much of a digital presence what the evidence behind their claims are. In the case of the Namibian story, founded. Um, the other thing you also want to pay attention to is potential biases. So Namibia, since independence, has been ruled by SWAPO, one party, and that's over 30 years now. The party is starting to crack in terms of its support. In the last election cycle, it was the lowest numbers the party had ever received, and we're parties gained momentum. But as a result, it also meant that we had to ask, were these people motivated by anti-SWAPO sentiment in any way? Did they have a bias toward the government and kind of wanted to bring the government? Even if it was legitimate, it was important to kind of acknowledge biases. And we did interview several local officials who were not a part of SWAPO. So we were very clear about indicating when they were of opposing parties. Again, particularly in who they're accusing, how they're accusing it, some of the coded language around it. And of course, because the Namibia apartheid legacy, like other countries in Southern Africa, there are the elements of white and black that you... But the fourth question I always say is, especially in investigative stories, almost certainly someone is being accused of something not be doing. And the question of going to those people and getting their side of the story is equally... actually be seven government ministries in charge of sanitation, which was not the most effective way to deal with the problem because it was highly decentralized and there was a complete lack of coordination. 
stop and drop sort of thing. So we had to go to the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture and Land, which were the probably two biggest of the seven that managed it and ask some tough questions and really challenge them. I mean, one of the things that the Minister of Health, I believe at the time had said was, well, you know, we're no worse than any of our neighbors. And it's like, actually, no, you're a lot worse than Botswana and you're a lot worse than Angola. And here's the data that bears that out. And they didn't necessarily want to engage with that reality. But again, we want to challenge our sources and lay as much of it bare in the text as possible. The other thing I would say, um, as basic as it sounds, uh, so I come from a visual medium and I always like to record in interviews with a camera if I can, because there are nuances in body language that are lost in audio. However, a lot of sources obviously do not like to go on camera. And so at the very minimum, you should be recording every interview and starting with fundamentals of having people spell their names, their affiliations, their identifiers, any sort of descriptors. Don't assume you ever know how to spell someone's name. I know as someone who does not have an English name in the United States, my name gets butchered almost every email exchange I'm on. So you always want to ask for that spelling. I have them actually often say it once or twice when I'm doing a recording just to make sure, particularly if there's some accents that I might miss. Um, but you want to know, like, are you identifying this guy as from the Ministry of Health or is he actually talking to you on background and he wants to be more of a vague government official? You know, are you talking to a woman who wants to identify herself as a mother of five who's struggling or does she want to identify herself as a local teacher? You want to make sure that you're kind of drawing all of that out. It sounds super basic, but you'd be amazed how many times I've asked reporters, are you sure that's how you spell that person's name? Are you sure that is the identifier that they want to use? And obviously you wanna transcribe all of this. Now there's a lot of software and there are a lot of uh, sites that will help you transcribe for very cheaply. Um, I use rev.com all the time. And if you do the, I think it's the uh, non-human one, it, maybe it's called automated. Almost every transcription I've ever done is under 10 US dollars, but you wanna make sure that you're transcribing it because the other thing is, when you're in the moment interviewing sources, I often tell reporters, like, just focus on the moment, listen to what they're saying, ask the key questions that you need to be asking afterwards, and then deal with the transcription later. You'll have a chance to read back on it and reflect, but don't think about, oh, how, how is this going to be captured in a transcription? What details of this do I need to really draw out now? Just focus on the interview. But on the back end, obviously, you're going to want to transcribe things. You're going to want to highlight up the wazoo. Freddie and Sonia, like I said, interviewed over 50 people. There were not 50 people cited in their final investigation. There were probably more like 18 to 20, which meant that they had to sift through those transcriptions and really figure out who was the most useful. Now, the other thing, and I say this particularly with investigative work, is that you often start in an investigation at one point and you end it far later. In this case, we had started the investigation on the ground in Namibia in November 2022. The stories didn't publish until May 2023. There can be a lot that happens in those six months for your sources on both sides of this, right? Whether they're sort of the victims or the government officials who are failing them. And so Freddie and Sonia went back to almost everyone in April. This was a month before publication to ask at the government made any strides on this issue. One of the things they learned was that there was indeed a new government sanitation plan that was circulating. It hadn't been passed yet, but it was circulating. And in it, in the draft that we had a copy of, they acknowledged their own failures. They said that there was a lack of coordination. They said that they had failed to educate. They said that they had pushed flush toilets when perhaps they should have pushed dry toilets, which were cheaper or more cost effective. And so again, the facts can change and we wanted our story to be as up to date when it ultimately published. Same thing with some of the victims, right? If one of your victims suddenly has a toilet, an operational toilet that they know how to operate and that they are using, you're going to want to acknowledge that and not paint them as just being victims in the storyline. So always go back, particularly when there's been a lapse. And like I said, in investigative stories, this is most common, I find. See if there are any updates and make sure you incorporate them because frankly, any good editor will also ask you that question down the line. Now, in addition to human sources, I always say, show me the numbers, right? How do you prove that what someone is telling you is more than just anecdotal? It's more than just their personal experience. And this is where you want to see if there's data available on it. Now, not every issue has lots of data on it, but the Namibia story was actually really great because the UN and World Health Organization had a joint program where they were tracking open defecation globally. The number I cited at the top of 47% open defecation rates, six in the world, that was from the UN and the World Health Organization. 
But then we wanted to get more granular because if I say to you, one out of every two Namibian is forced to rely on open defecation, you might think that if you go at any place in Namibia, it's a 50-50 chance. But the reality is actually more nuanced. And that's where we wanted to go more granular. We went into the Namibian census numbers and we went into the Namibia Chamber of Environment numbers and we were able to track regionally the disparity. So indeed the rural areas were far worse. Rural Kavungu East, rural Kavungu West, all the way up North, they were 70 plus on the open defecation scale. Closer to Vinhook, the capital, the numbers were much, much lower. But in those informal settlements around the capital, it was around 40%. And so we wanted to be able to draw out that nuance. Yes, it's a national problem, but it is certainly heightened in specific areas. And we needed some of the more granular government data to get to it. So there are a variety of, of sources. I've already mentioned government sources and more of the NGO world. And there could be nonprofits, academics who are doing research, advocacy groups. I also like to say random dudes on the internet. Not all random dudes on the internet have bad data, but they do require more vetting, right? There has to be the questioning of why is this person involved in this issue? For example, if we had found someone, we didn't in this case, who was tracking sanitation in Namibia, I would have been a little bit surprised by this only because like, why does someone care about open defecation rates unless they have some vested interest, right? Unless they're a Namibian, maybe they're a young data scraper or reporter trying to expose something and they haven't quite gathered the information. But random dudes on the internet can be useful. And at CCIJ right now, we're working on another story where a random dude on the internet in Nigeria is actually really critical <laughs> to some of the data that we are collecting. So I say that because numbers do lie or they can be manipulated. And so with any data, whether it's the UN or the Namibian government, you always wanna ask how the data was calculated. You wanna understand the methodology behind it because the reality is that the UN did not go in and interview 2.5 million Namibians to arrive at that 47% metric, right? They took some sampling and extrapolated from there. So yes, I would say that in general, we would rely on the UN or the World Health Organization, but you do want to question the methodology behind any data set you have. And if you have any concerns about it, I think it is worth seeing if there are alternate sources of data that you don't have concerns about. We're talking through, in our case, with our data editors about how credible that those sources are. The other thing is that the numbers that are being represented in that data or that you want to rep represent in your story, you have to ask the question of, does this show one definitive truth or there a range of truth? And that's why I, I hearken back to us going granular at the regional level. There's the one in two Namibians lack adequate access to sanitation figure. And then there's the, if you're in a rural area, your risk is two thirds. And if you're in an informal settlement, it's two fifths. And if you're in the capital, you're probably not actually gonna have much of an issue. In fact, you may not even know it's an issue outside of the capital. So these, these numbers require contextualization, which often requires going even more granular into some of the data. And that is also the question of have they been rounded or exaggerated? We do know that when numbers get rounded, their meanings change. And so we try to be as precise in our stories with the figures that we know definitively and with the methodology that we use to calculate it. In fact, one of the things we've incorporated into a lot of CCIJ reporting on the data side is being transparent when this is based on a calculation that we at CCIJ have made based on someone else's data. And in the Namibia story, there was actually a good amount of that. So we tried to note that as well. But of course, it's not just humans and it's not just data. There are a variety of other sources that you could be using to substantiate both what your human sources are saying and any sort of data that you have. Your human sources may be providing you actual documentation. Um, in the Namibia story, I'll go through some of those examples in another slide. But one of the big pieces of um, documentation that really shed light on the story were the government documents, because it seemed almost every four to five years, the government would issue a new sanitation and hygiene plan, where it would say all of the right things. We're gonna install X number of toilets in each of these areas, and we're gonna teach people how to maintain them. And we are going to achieve the UN sustainability goal, which I think is number six, that we are going to not have any open defecation, we'll have sanitation for all. They said all the right things and they said it pretty consistently from report to report. And so seeing the government lay out that this was what it had committed itself to really helped us kind of hold the feet of the government officials to the fire on the storyline. But then there were also the ministries that would issue their own reports, not speaking for the whole government, but just speaking for the Ministry of Health or just speaking for Ministry of Agriculture and Land. And suddenly there would be disparities. One would say we installed X number of toilets. The other one would say, actually it was this number. And you would sort of question, well, you both can't be right. Who's telling the truth? So government documents were at the core. 
And the irony in all of this was that most of these were posted on the government website. It wasn't even like us digging that deeply. It's just that most people don't read long, you know, wordy government reports on sanitation. So it took us to do that work to begin to notice those discrepancies. Similarly, you can have NGOs or nonprofits. Obviously, UNICEF was all over the storyline. The UN Sustainable Development Goal, as I mentioned, is still a goal for 2030 in terms of sanitation. So that was a prime support. There was less academic research in this particular area, but often there can be. The other thing, when we were starting to piece the story together, I said there was no comprehensive investigation into this, but there were isolated articles we would see in the Namibian or the Namibian Sun that would say, you know, this village doesn't have sanitation or this, the government dropped off three toilets here and all the pipes were stolen. And you began to piece together that there was a problem, but no one had brought it all together. So sometimes those articles can be useful. Then of course there's social media posts. I'm gonna get into social media posts in a bit. Um, thankfully on the Namibian story, we didn't have to rely that much on social media posts because obviously they are like random dudes on the internet going to require more vetting. But just like with human sources, I ask the same question with non-human sources. Are they authoritative or are they non-authoritative? And once again, you wanna lean into the authoritative sources. Those authoritative sources are often those first-hand accounts from your human sources. Maybe they took videos, maybe they photographed the issue outside of their home, someone engaging in open defecation, someone running away from a car as they were running from a dump site where they had been openly defecating. There could be audio recordings, particularly of government officials, perhaps on the record or not realizing they were on the record saying certain things, but your, your human sources can provide you with a lot of documentation. And then there's going to be other research or reported articles that maybe if in the academic world, they've been peer reviewed. If they're more um, you know, advocacy related, those have value too, if they are specific human voices that we're referring to on the ground. And of course, media reports from outlets that you would deem reputable. So perhaps not the one that you've never ever heard of. And when you Google it, nefarious things come up. On the non-authoritative side, the unvetted social media posts, which I will get to in a minute, obviously can be a huge issue. Um, and then the non-peer reviewed, the non-reliable sources that you can't seem to actually trace all the way back and you can't confirm with other sourcing. A lot of the information in the Namibia story was confirmed with other sourcing, even sometimes one government report confirming another government report. So you really wanna do that comparative analysis with all the sources you have. So social media posts. And I, in this conversation is where we'll begin to talk through AI, but I like to talk about images, video, and then just AI generated images and video. So we could do an entire training just on this. And there's so much work that's actually being done in this space now to give journalists more tools to do it. I'm, like I said, a very high level overview, but I'll tell you how I approach it. Any image that I know that our photographer hasn't taken, I will have them, I, I have a magnifying app on my phone. I pull up the image as largely as I can without obviously reducing the pixelation. And I, I, I examine it like I'm a detective. I'm looking for bad lighting or mismatched lighting. I'm looking for pixelation. I'm looking to see, and I know I've done this on my phone when I snap a photo and then I have to like crop it down before I share it with someone. And there's that awkward black line on the top or the bottom or the side where you know that this is not the original source. So you're looking for some of those indications that this image has been manipulated. Now it doesn't mean that it has no value, but it does mean that you're not dealing with the original one. The classic is you want to do that reverse image lookup. Google is one of the best. In the United States, I often use TinEye because they index a lot more US-based sites, um, but either one of them is great for plopping that image down, seeing where else it has appeared. Has it appeared on legitimate news sites? Has it been cited in government reports? Or has it been posted on you know, some random dude's website or some conspiracy-laden website? You wanna begin to kind of decipher where that information comes from. But of course, you also wanna look at the metadata, right? That invisible information that's embedded in every original image. Um, most people will do this in Photoshop or some sort of photo editing software. I use uh, metadata to go um, which is a free website where you can do that and it's equally helpful. Um, but unfortunately these days, even metadata can sometimes be manipulated. And so they're even more sophisticated sites like image edited, which I believe is still free. Um, and that will go even more granular. I mean, it's looking at every single pixel to see if anything is out of place. So you wanna do that sort of critical examination. You wanna know what the origin of that image is. You wanna know if there's been any manipulation to it. 
The same rules do apply. Sorry. Ah, um, I jumped ahead uh, to videos as well. Um, so uh, again, I come from a visual medium. I've worked on the TV side of news for a long time as well. So whenever I see a video, the first thing I do is see if any of our competitor outlets have posted the same video. Um, if they haven't, that often actually does give me some pause. And then what I'll do is I'll watch that video multiple times. I'll look for gaps in time or awkward cuts, um, jumps in the footage that just don't quite make sense. I'll see if the images look pixelated or discolored, like someone grabbed it, um, you know, like recorded it in a movie theater sort of thing and compromised the quality as a result of it. But then you can still do the reverse Google image search where you take a screenshot of it and plop it in. And that is also a helpful way to begin to identify it. There are third party tools like InVid, which again, that one may not be free anymore, um, but if it's not, it's still relatively cheap where you can actually find in the case of a social media post uh, where who posted it, um, who is the origin of it. And then you can do your own vetting of that source. So as an example, you can see, you know, in their, let's say, Twitter buyer, or maybe I should say X bio, uh, you know, do they have any particular business affiliations, government associations? What are the other things that they have been tweeting about? Try to get a sense of who they are, uh, because that's another way to kind of critically examine is this a reliable source or not? Okay, so AI, again, this one could probably be multiple sessions onto its own, but there are certain things that we are noticing in the AI space. And I should say this after talking with several computer scientists over the last few days, the way that AI in the United States is developing right now is that you have the AI computer that is trying to game you, and then you have a second AI computer that is trying to identify the holes in the first one. And as it identifies the holes in the first one, the first one gets better at covering up those holes. So you almost have two computers that are competing with each other in the AI space to get to make that first computer even better at AI. That said, there are some key issues, um, particularly with human beings. I think it's a lot easier to spot. And it's often around key features of the face, hands, and accessories. So. For those who don't know, this is Nancy Pelosi, former House Speaker. In one photo, she's with Trump, and in another photo, she's not. Now, you might not be able to see it on the slide deck, but afterwards, when you get the slides, again, take out that magnifying app or zoom in. She has an extra thumb in this photo. And that is your first sign that this is an AI-generated one. But there are other elements of this photo that are a little bit mm, jarring. He looks airbrushed. He looks airbrushed. The facial expressions are somewhat exaggerated. So you wanna be looking at hands. Often there will be an extra finger in AI generated images. Teeth as well. AI is very difficult. Every single one of us has a unique set of teeth. That is not a plug and play. Same thing with eyes. Often I say they almost look like demonic or possessed, a little bit exorcist-ish because eyes are equally challenging. And same thing with accessories. If you wear glasses or have any sort of jewelry, AI can struggle sometimes to do a perfect replication of that. So humans are a little bit easier. Again, you wanna to look to see if something looks super Photoshopped or airbrushed, or if it's the reverse. And in video, AI generated video, there's often that lag between the audio and the motion, which drives me crazy. Um, but when someone's talking a little bit faster than the action is happening or vice versa. And the other issue in video that often arises is a lack of facial expression and body movement because of how it's sort of been edited together. So there are ways that you can do that. There are a lot of quizzes online where you can kind of test your knowledge of, can you spot the AI generated one? Axios, which I, I quoted here, uh, is one of them. Um, but I do encourage you to do that, particularly around the human element of it, because you will begin to notice when someone has an extra finger or someone has extra teeth. Of course, and this is selfish, I'm sure, for me, but the key to your editor's heart is keeping all of this organized as you go along. So the Namibian story, as I said, it, it unfolded over six months of interviews and investigation. And if Freddie and Sonia had not done the following, I think it would have been a nightmare to try to bring to fruition. So the first thing is they kept a running list of all their sources and all their research, particularly ones that had URLs, and they were very clear what facts they corresponded to. So if you're talking about that UN figure that I mentioned multiple times, they had the link directly to the UN WHO database so that I could check that relatively quickly. If you're talking about transcriptions, they prepared all these transcriptions. And then what they would do is indicate which interviews they ultimately cited and which quotes they would highlight within them. Um, 
I will look at those in particular, and I'll get to that a little bit later, because I want to see the context in which quotes were taken, if they were fully taken in context, and if there's key information about those individuals that was either shared or not shared that might need to be. But then you also want to create that digital folder, because there are certain elements that may not have URLs. As an example, I alluded to earlier, Freddie and Sonia got access to a document that the government hadn't yet approved but it was the most recent sanitation plan. And so we just had a PDF and we quoted it probably three or four times in the investigation. So it was one of those things where we needed to have all of those kinds of files as well in one digital folder. Now, on the other side, you're the editor of the fact checker. So you are kind of going through the same process as a reporter has gone, but you're doing that second level. And sometimes you may bring a certain area of expertise or knowledge that allows you to dig a little bit deeper on some of the sourcing. I always say the three prongs of fact checking for an editor is that you want to verify that all the statements are factual. You want to investigate the credibility of the sources of all of those statements, and you want to preserve all that documentation, particularly in investigative work where someone may call you out, where there's a higher risk of litigation, uh, where you know that you're ruffling some feathers. That's why that digital folder I just represented or just spoke about is so helpful. But it's the verify, investigate, and document. So what do I mean by verify? I will go through a story and I will highlight all the facts, all the figures, all the names, all the quotes, and I'll put them into these two categories of the gathered sources that are based on basically the non-human sources, right? The documents, the government data, other newspaper articles that might be cited, and then all the human sources, those names and those quotes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the facts that I have with that digital folder of all of the sourcing that I've been provided to make sure that I do have sourcing for everyone, that every single person quoted in that story, I have a transcription for, as an example, and I'm not just taking the reporter's word that he interviewed him. And if anything initially, this is really the spot check, seems questionable, I might ask for alternative sourcing. In this particular story, this happened on a couple of these small news sources that were cited that when I started to do a little bit of digging on, I didn't think were the most reputable. I didn't think that we should be relying or quoting their numbers. And I wanted to see if there were larger papers uh, that had covered that. So it's kind of the initial spot check. But then you get into the investigation. So you take all your gathered sources, your non-human sources, and now you want to go through and see if the figures match the sources. If the UN and the WHO say it's 47%, do in fact, the does, the, does the database <laughs> say that as well? Or has the number changed because the database has been updated? One of the key challenges, particularly with data, is when was the data collected? Have there been updates in the time since the data was collected? And is the data even outdated? This is a question we ask in the Namibia story, the most recent data we really could get was from 2020, which granted is not super old, but there had to be an acknowledgement that some things could have happened over two to three years. Um, so you wanna kind of compare every single thing. You should be able to find that corresponding fact in that digital folder of sources. And if you can't, or something seems outdated or slightly off, Again, you want to ask your reporter for alternative sourcing, or you, you may want to eliminate that fact because you're not sure. I know some of the initial sourcing we found on Namibia was actually going back to 2000, 2005. And obviously that was not an accurate reflection. 20 year old data is probably not data we should be citing in investigative reporting. Maybe it works in a history article, but not in an investigative source. So you do want to go line by line. And I will admit this can be very tedious work. I'm a nerd and love this sort of thing, but it can be. Same thing with interviews. Um, you wanna review your transcription notes and identify all the stories that were included. Like I said, he had 50 people who were interviewed, 18 to 20 of them made it into the story. I wanted to understand why those 18 to 20 were chosen, what was unique about their stories and why those specific quotes were used. And the thing about quotes is that any quote can be taken out of context. I think one of the biggest gripes that you will hear from someone when they do not like an article in which they've been quoted is that they will say that their quotes were taken out of context. That or they were misquoted. But the out of context one is a trickier one and it involves reading through the transcription so that you see the before and after. And maybe you add more contextualization. In the case of a lot of the government officials who we had to interview and ask the tough questions, we ended up adding in more of their quotes to the text because we felt like 
we were going to give them license to accuse us of just taking that one line, that kind of the gotcha moment, and not providing the full context. So it's okay to provide more of it. And in fact, we actually move the government's defense of itself higher up in parts of the story as well, because we wanted to be very clear that there was some acknowledgement from the government of failure, but not enough. And that there was a lot of finger pointing going on. And the easiest way to do that was actually to do it sooner in the story and to give them more space for their quotes. By the way, this is why we ultimately broke the story up into three chapters, because it became a 6,000 word saga and 2,000 words a piece made it slightly <laughs> easier. Um, one of the things I do, and again, not everyone will do this, but I do think it's a good practice. I will often ask for the contact information of sources so that I can call and do a spot check. And doesn't mean I'm reading back exact quotes, but I want to make sure that the reporter is accurately kind of capturing who this individual is, that this person would say something similar if asked the same question today. Um, again, you're not going to do that with 50 people necessarily, but I will usually do it with a kind of key handful of people and often the ones who are being accused of wrongdoing because they're, they're the ones most likely to bite back, right? The other thing I'll do and I know that I said reporters need to background check and vet their sources, but I will do an additional layer of that if I think that there's anything that could compromise their credibility. In the Namibian context, it was really about the politics of a one-party government, and if these were members of the opposition and had a vendetta. Um, that was a key part of what I was looking at. A lot of these locals and informal settlements in rural areas did not. In fact, they couldn't even tell you who in the government was responsible. They would just sort of say this generic, you know, the government has failed us sort of thing. Um, but you do want to research that. You know, we had a mayor, I think it was a Vintook, who was not of the same party, who was very ready to accuse as an example. So you do want to research that. And if anyone has any credibility issues, links, less so in this story, but in other stories that we've done, links to companies that have vested interests that might compromise their integrity, you do wanna consider eliminating them. After you've done that basic fact check as an editor, I like to say this is the step back phase. This is where I like, I wanna kind of assess the story as a whole and ask four key questions. Is it precise? Is it clear? Is it fair? And is it missing any key detail that might change the way we see or understand the story? So the precise is the basic fact checking in many ways that we were talking about, right? You're checking all of the numbers, you're checking all of the names, you're making sure everything is spelled correctly, you're making sure all the numbers are up to date, that they match the sourcing that you have, and that any calculations that you've done based on those numbers, you've double checked the math. I'm not a math student, but you always want to double check the math. Um, same thing for people. Some people may get new jobs, their business affiliations may change. And so you wanna make sure that you have the most up-to-date information on everyone, everything, and that it's as accurate as possible. But there's also this element, and this comes up in a lot of African stories that I've worked on, of the history. Checking the history to contextualize the present day reality. So one of the key story, key problems, I should say, in the Namibia story, is that the government wanted to push some dry toilets. The dry toilets have a very negative association in Namibia from the apartheid era, because during the apartheid era, the white government would prioritize flush toilets for white people, and Black Namibians would wind up either with holes in the ground or dry toilets. So there's this negative colonial connection that actually complicated the story. It meant that the government today, knowing that dry toilets were a cheaper and perhaps more cost-effective approach, couldn't actually get public acceptance around it too. So it's not just a government issue, there's this whole colonial legacy they have to navigate. And that was important to add to that story. We didn't initially have it there, but it sort of came out when I was triggered by why they were so resistant to flush toilets. So that was an important piece of it. And like I said, in a lot of African stories, you will encounter kind of the colonial legacy seeping in in various ways. Is it clear? So I always say you want to cater to the person who knows the least about your particular subject, kind of assume they know nothing. Um, I'm not from Namibia. I'm a white American. What do I understand and what don't I understand? So if there are unfamiliar terms, I'm not someone who believes you can't use a big word in a story, but I am someone who believes you can't use a big word in a story and assume everyone understands it. You have to be able to define what it, an unfamiliar term is and sort of justify its use within the story. Um, this could be technical terms for sure. And you know, when you talk about sanitation, there are certainly some def technical terms. We even talked about defining defecation um, at one point in the story, but you do not want to assume that people know. And I will say the minute I have to go Google something when I'm reading a story, I've left the story half the time. 
Um, same thing with acronyms. This was a big thing in the, the Namibia story because, like I said, seven ministries involved, they each had their acronyms. There was a MER, there was a MA, there was a MLAO, and you had to define at the onset what they were. But because we divided it in chapters, I didn't assume that if you read chapter one on day one that you remembered that it was the Ministry of Health and Social Services, MAS, on day three. So sometimes you have to redefine acronyms, particularly if there's been a large gap in the story. Um, and like I said, when you have lots of government ministries, a lot of government officials love to use acronyms too when they talk about things. WASH is a big acronym in the sanitation space um, that we heard a lot. You always wanna be clear in defining them. Same thing with words in another language. So depending on who your target audience is, we were writing this in English, thinking more of an English speaking audience, but there are certain terms, particularly in rural areas where local languages um, often reign supreme that were used. It's okay to use some of those. In fact, I actually like it because I think it gives a certain authenticity and color, but just don't assume that a non-English speaker understands it and define it. So that's what I'm saying about clarity. No one should be confused about the terminology. No one should be confused about who's being spoken about or what is being spoken about. And this is the story fair. This is what I call the legal one. Um, whenever I sit down with our lawyers, these are the questions they're going to ask. Are there value judgments being made in the story? This is one of the concern our lawyers had flagged to us early on, that it wasn't our job to say the government has failed. It was our job to say the government promised 100,000 toilets and it delivered five and let the reader deduce from there that the government had failed. So we ended up stripping out some of the language that said failure and just laying out the facts, which you know, can be challenging because there's this sense of wanting to editorialize just a little bit to spice up the language. Same thing with superlatives. It's almost, you are almost always wrong when you say always <laughs> in a story, right? Or every in a story or only in a story. It's actually probably much safer to hedge and say in many cases or in most cases. So that's something that I really pay attention to because that is one of those things that is almost always wrong. Um, and when you're making value judgments, you often insert some of those superlatives into it. The other thing is being transparent about the limitations. I think we all have this idea that the reporter does the investigation and then has all of the answers. And the reality is that's just not true. The reporter has as much information as they've been able to gather. And in the case of Namibia, this was a complicated story because you were dealing with multiple national government agencies or ministries. You were dealing with local counselors, tribal ones, and then advocacy groups that were kind of moving in that space. And then locals who just didn't know who to blame, but were deeply frustrated by that reality. And so who was actually to blame in the story? It was a little bit vaguer than you might think. It was, instead of saying it was SWAPO even, the ruling party, um, we spoke about very specific ministries that had very specific roles and responsibilities that didn't seem to be carrying out. But we also acknowledged that there was a lot we didn't know. There was this new government proposal that hadn't yet been approved in which the government did admit to a lot of things, but it didn't admit to certain things. And so it's okay to say to your reader, like, this is what we know. And then there's some stuff we don't know. Um, transparency is my big, I'm a huge believer, of course, within journalism, but also about the data, right? I mean, we had data that stopped in 2020. And the reality is things could have changed since 2020, maybe not dramatically, but enough to alter the conversation. So we had to be very clear multiple times that this was 2020 data. And then of course, this, the last question of going out to those who are accused of wrongdoing and choosing the most relevant quotes. And this is where I said we ended up adding in a little bit more to the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture and Land um, responses because we really did want to show that at least in one of the ministry's cases, they were much more willing to engage with their own failures than the other, but actually laying them there side by side, I think it was even more obvious. And there's not much lost in giving a little bit more space to those who are being accused, to be frank. Sometimes they hang themselves. Um, and I, I felt that way a little bit with the Ministry of Health when the Ministry of Health was just denying basic facts like Botswana's problem is as bad as Namibia. And, and it's just like there's zero data to, to support that. And then the missing part of it. So uh, we all know that it's very easy to not mention things that might complicate our story or take away from the, the overall premise of it. This comes up a lot when we're doing um, pollsters are polling people. What are the questions they ask? How do they frame it? What don't they ask? 
Um, in the case of Namibia, because this new government document had emerged in those six months of reporting, we actually had to add that in. We had to acknowledge that A, the government was taking some responsibility and B, they were putting out what was perhaps their most comprehensive plan yet. Um, but in some of these deeper investigations, they're going to be individuals or companies that you may not even initially think to go back to because they're not directly um, having the finger pointed at them, but they're indirectly and there is some space for potential legal liability um, or just general distortion. So are there key things that are missing? Um, the Namibia story, that government document was probably the best example of it. So that's me coming kind of to the end of my spiel. Um, a lot of what I put together today is from some of these key fact-checking resources, but there are ones that are really useful when you're actually working on a fact-check in a story. Uh, we have a few that are more Africa-specific, a few that are more kind of generalist ones, and obviously this will be included in the slides that you receive, so don't feel like you have to write everything down. Um, but there are many, many guides <laughs> that have been written in the space, and there are country-specific ones that are quite useful. So with that, I will stop talking and turn it over to Jeff. Okay, no, wonderful. Thank you uh, very much. Can we please uh, acknowledge Jaffa's terrific presentation? Give her a round of applause, either virtual or through clapping. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I really appreciated uh, the emphasis on the dual perspectives, on carrying this out through talking about a real story. And for us, and I know Fola has put the link to the three part series, which had very strong impact almost immediately, um, in part due to this tremendous work, vetting, fact-checking, and making sure that the information was as accurate as possible. So that that really appreciated that dual perspective within the context of um, a story that was a, a, a real laborious effort and on which Yafa served both as editorial lead, but also project manager and has, has really raised the bar for us in a number of different ways. So just a, a, a wonderful application to give very concrete approach in addition to resources and issues and so on. So no, just, just terrific. Thank you so much. And Yafa, there are a couple of questions that have come up in the chat, which I just wanted to mm -hmm. share. And then from there, if other people have other or related questions, please feel free. So Joseph is asking, for questions with a faster turnaround, how do you expedite fact checking without cutting too many corners? And so maybe that's some of the, you know, it's kind of CNN muscle memory <laughs> might be germane yeah. there. And then yeah. Shine, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Shine. Shine is saying, when working within a small locale or community, how do you minimize risk of sources not wanting to speak with you again if the story is not in their favor? So the the risk, but also if they look bad, then you know how do you go back to them and get that verification? So, very very uh, different but interesting and, and questions. I think both kind of germane in the Namibia a little bit more the second than the first, but we did have a pretty great turnaround on the follow the follow up story yeah. that we did after the impact. So over to you, and yeah. if other people have other questions, um, please please let us know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so Joseph, I'll, I'll take the first one on fast turnaround. Yes, as Jeff mentioned, my other job at CNN is very much in the speaking news realm. And we are often competing against, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post to get a particular story out. Um, one of the things I like to do is be really crystal clear with my, my human sources on what the deadline is. I find, and this doesn't matter if you're working in a Western context, if you're working in an African context, you need to be very clear, and often I will re-emphasize it in writing um, and on the phone. I need this answer by 6 p.m. Otherwise, that that will not be included. And I think, you know, nine out of 10 times when I give people hard deadlines, um, they're much more likely to respond than when they're given an open deadline. I think it's a human psychology thing. Like, we think we have more time when someone doesn't give us a deadline. Obviously, journalism is a very deadline-driven industry, but I'd like to be clear on timeline. I also, as I said, like to be clear on what we don't know. If you ultimately can't get a key fact that you need to include in a story or that you feel is important to include, it's okay to say we reached out to so-and-so X number of times for comment, and they didn't respond. So we haven't been able to confirm this, but this is what so-and-so alleges as an example. So you can be, like I said, transparent about what you don't know. Um, and you can also call out and acknowledge everything you've done to get to that information. Um, so that, that, that those are some quick things about the fast turnaround. 
When you're working, um, Shine, in lo local communities and you want to minimize risk, I often say this is the danger of parachute journalism, right? You have some foreign person walk into a community and expect them to open up to you and have trust in you. That's just not how it works. I talk about Freddie and Sonia um, doing a lot of this field work in November, but I should give you some context. Sonia is actually Namibian um, and she lives and operates in Namibia. She's been an investigative reporter there for several years. So she already has some credibility there. She's built up her credentials. Even at CCIJ, we worked with her previously on stories that we thought were quite impactful. So there was a certain degree of trust. Freddie, however, is British. He's not Namibian, he's a white guy. And that required trust. And so while they started a lot of this field reporting in November, they actually started this project probably in May. Um, so six months prior, they were working to identify sources long before Freddie and Sonia were on the ground interviewing those sources. And I say that because you often have to build trust with people. And that is not something that you can assume, particularly when you look and sound different and walk into a community. Um, any background work you can do to begin that trust, to begin to explain what you're trying to do or expose before you get there is really important. It also helps you identify a, if you're going to need something like an interpreter or a fixer, particularly if you're going into you know rural, very rural parts i've noticed this in my own reporting in africa where you can just you cannot assume that whatever the colonizer language is is what everyone there will speak um that's important now in terms of a story not being in their favor you know this is a tricky thing because i often say we don't go into journalism to become friends with our sources we go into journalism to hold people to account and that means inevitably that we're going to piss some people off along the way um, it's just the fact. And if that is something, if that's a hard pill to swallow, then I think it is worth sometimes questioning, you know, what are my motivations for doing this? That said, you don't want to make an enemy out of everyone. I'm the last person to do that. I'm a diplomat's daughter. Um, so I do think that there are ways to be transparent. Um, and that I think starts with being transparent about what the story is that you're trying to tell up front. They shouldn't be surprised to read something when it publishes. That's I think people react to the element of surprise when they're caught off guard. If you say, you know, you're going into this village, you are trying to understand why no one has adequate access to sanitation, who is responsible for it. And let's say you're interviewing, you know, the mayor or the, the head of the city council or the tribal leader who may ultimately bear some responsibility for this. You want to be very clear that you are trying to get to the source of it. And if that person ultimately has any responsibility, A, you'll go back to them and make sure you get comment from them before publishing, uh, but B, they won't be surprised by what they read. The element of surprise is really what I found nine out of 10 times what upsets people the most. Um, so again, I think it's about building respect and trust in a community before you show up, particularly if you're an outsider. And I think it's about being very explicit about what your goals are and not surprising them when a story publishes. I don't know if that answers those two sufficiently, but. No, thank you for that, Yafa, and um, thank you for those questions, uh, Joseph and, and Shine. I did also want to mention with the Namibia Project, Scott Lewis, who is our visual editor, uh, in connecting with Margaret. Margaret had done authoritative work for many years around water coverage, so I think that also helped with some of those elements of sort of credibility and trust and so on, and they were a very strong team, and so that was a very powerful element. And one of the things we try and do at CCIJ is work with people over time. So Yapa's intervention to bring uh, Sonia in to strengthen that local connection to the question that was raised around that, I think was a really important one as well as Scott connecting with Margaret is very authoritative chronicler. So thank you for that. I did also just want to mention that uh, Mike Riley, a, a colleague and friend and journalist, journalism trainer uh, from Chicago has been sharing some really helpful tools uh, in the chat. So just if you want to check that out, in addition to listening to Yafa's riveting presentation, please do so. And I saw that Abdullah uh, requested, and I think a couple of people asked about the PowerPoint. So part of what we do as a follow-up is you will have uh, access both on YouTube, uh, but also then uh, as a follow-up note that FOLA will send, will be uh, in containing those PowerPoint materials. So don't worry, Abdullah, we totally understand. And so, one thing, Jeff, just yeah. to add, we've also created for this presentation uh, two checklists, one for reporters and one for editors of the questions okay. that you should be asking yourself. So it draws from this presentation, but it's sort of like a one page PDF that you can kind of tick tick off as you go along. One, oh, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so so we're just coming up on the hour now. 
So what I would say is if uh, folks do want to stay, uh, Yaf has mentioned she will be able to stay around uh, for a little bit to field any additional questions. If folks want to go, we just want to uh, thank you again very much for attending. Again, I apologize for the inconvenience uh, for some folks around the timing. We'll make sure to work and improve that going forward. And please uh, do stay connected. We really welcome and appreciate the global community that we're building together. So again, thank you so much, Yafa, and obviously Fola for getting the word out. Thank you very much. And uh, we will sign off unless I'll stay, you know, we'll stay on for a little bit if anybody does want to continue the conversation for a little while. Thank you so much and lovely to see everybody. Thank you. Yeah, Natalie is asking, uh, what is the best way to connect with investigative editors slash reporter mentors? Now, I have, a, I have a quick answer about, of course, joining CCIJ. <laughs> yeah. But perhaps just a touch self-promotional, Natalie. <laughs> but we will put that link in the chat. <laughs> but yeah, if I didn't want to interrupt, I just, you know, yeah. that's a very welcome setup. Thank you, Natalie, for that setup. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Natalie. Um, look, I mean, there are a lot of good investigative journalism outlets there. Um, GIJN, which I, I did source in this presentation, uh, the Global Investigative Journalism Network is, is a wonderful resource. A, they have a lot of free resources on their site, even if you don't have a human who can be a mentor, but they also host a significant conference. I do believe going to some of these conferences can also be quite helpful. Um, it's a way to meet who these investigative reporters and editors are. GIJN has one of them. Um, at the very beginning of this, we were talking about one that happens in Johannesburg in South Africa every year called AIJC. Um, so going, joining the conference circuit, or at least, you know, a few of them um, is a really great way to connect. Um, ICIJ, which is based in Washington, D.C., the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, they're another good resource. Um, I have found, especially when I was starting out, because I work with them on Panama Papers, uh, they were great at like throwing mentors at you. <laughs> That's what you were looking for. Cause they really, they wanted to make sure, especially on some of the large scale investigative works and they do these collaborative stories across countries that the journals they were working with felt confident and up to speed uh, with the skills that they needed. Um, so that's another wonderful resource. I do think CCIJ, we do have these monthly trainings in a variety of fields. Um, and we're also all like pretty friendly people who you can reach out to with questions. Um, I don't think my email is in it, but if Fola wants to share it, I'm happy to field, you know, any questions someone has in that space. Yeah, no, th thank you uh, for that, Yafa. Then the other thing I just wanted to mention was um, IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors, an excellent point about attending the conferences. And in fact, if you attend IRE for an initial time, uh, you can in fact sign up for a mentor. I've, I've uh, been a mentor when my first conference in 2006 served as a mentor, and it's a very meaningful and a way to enter the community, kind of an ongoing relationship. So, um, okay, so, so now Natalie's following up uh, and asking about the cost of attending multiple conferences, which can be yeah, absolutely yeah. substantial. Is there a virtual network now now we really can even more authentically plug CCI. <laughs> yeah so I do think IRE I mean during COVID a lot of these conferences did go virtual um, and a lot of them still have virtual components it may not be the entire conference that you can access virtually um, but certainly a good number of the sessions now they will also um, kind of simulcast or you know do a zoom at the same time so it's that's perhaps one of the few positives out of COVID that there are a lot more virtual opportunities with these conferences uh, I don't know what the cost on all of those are and I certainly understand sometimes costs can be prohibitive but I also think that um, IRE which Jeff you might know how much the membership costs but one of the great things about IRE is that you get access to all of these free trainings you know from like very kind of tech computer specific ones to broader ones um, and it comes with your membership for free for the years that I've had it I've always taken advantage of these online tutorials that go from like very beginner to advanced so those networks do offer that yeah, no, th thank you, Yaf. And there are different types of memberships uh, for IRE. So if depending on kind of where you are in your life and career, uh, student is at one level, about $25 a year, up to about $75 uh, for uh, professional, academic, and retired, a little different. So um, yeah, so no, absolutely, uh, th that, is, that is an option. 
And the other thing is, I would just mention, Natalie, depending on what you're looking for in particular, there can be other organizations that might be hosting some session that would be providing some of the information that you would like, like the National Freedom of Information Coalition. The United States, they're very strong on public records requests. They have a conference that, as Yafa mentioned, is online every year and can be pretty useful and really is you know almost nothing to attend. So just kind of depending on what you want to do, um, that that you know there, there are those different options. So okay, so thank you for that, Natalie. Anybody else? Other uh, questions, uh, issues people want to raise? Yes. Yeah, Fendel, you had a question. Yes, Fendel. Yeah, so I sometimes feel like the odd person out. I, ha I don't have a journalism background. I have an information science background. And I'm super interested in running into other people who have a similar background, whether they went to library school or uh, have degrees in information science. Um, so that's why I'm here today is because I don't have a journalism background and I want to make sure that the work I'm doing aligns with standards and practices and journalism. Um, do you know of any resources uh, that I might utilize besides the ones already mentioned? Uh, and, and for what specifically, Fendel, around fact checking or uh, for what 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 uh, what what resources are you looking for in particular, just so we can answer the. Yeah, sure. Maybe for folks who don't have a journalism background um, and who are involved in the work um, on the research side and the fact checking side, uh, I, I find that fact checking is I mean, it's it's heavy on the editorial side, so. I want to make sure that when I'm doing this work, I'm communicating with journalists in a way that is when when their work is being edited potentially. Okay. okay. No, thank you for that clarifying comment. And um, I would just say uh, we we you are very welcome in our community, and we hope that you you know consider coming to other trainings and so on. So you're you're very welcome. I had some thoughts, but obviously Yafa, was there anything you wanted to say on that in terms of Fendel saying, I'm kind of coming from outside the discipline. I want to make sure I'm doing it the right way, basically. Yeah, I think one of the things that's actually kind of unique about even our CCIJ setup is that not everyone who works at CCIJ is necessarily even a journalist um, as well. So our our, our designer, um, who's terrific, isn't, and I actually really appreciate, A, not always having, having that outside perspective, not just having a journalist in the room, because I think that they can ask critical questions that journalists who sometimes get stuck inside of our own heads or inside of the same room um, for too long. Uh, so I think there's tremendous value to the work that you are doing. Um, I know that when at CNN, as an example, we have a whole library um, crew <laughs> that we reach out to when we're doing work. And a lot of the times it is um, more in the archive archival space or, you know, thinking microfilm uh, with newspapers, trying to find things. I mean, you know, sites like the New York Times have digitized things going back decades, but a lot of the smaller papers don't have those sorts of budgets. Um, and so I, I know that I really turn to our librarians in trying to find older information as a kind of very contemporary example. Um, after the tragic fire in Maui this last week, one of the stories that I was working on in CNN was really looking at uh, what are the worst buyers in US history. And this requires going back, frankly, to the 1800s, um, possibly even earlier, but the 1800s is when we start to have some decent documentation. Now, I would not on my own probably have been able to find all of this. Um, I sort of kind of, you know, it's like my my memory, and I say a lot of journalist memory is about three years long. It goes back to the, the fire in California um, in paradise. And that was 2018. <laughs> and I knew that there almost certainly had been worse fires. And so, you know, I think what, what, what information science librarians can really bring to it is the ability to have a memory that's more than three to five years long. Um, and to kind of bring that information into the fold. You, I mean, you know, better than, than I do where you kind of get that information from. I know a lot of what I rely on are these old newspaper articles that may not always be digitized yet. Um, but, Jeff, I would definitely turn to you on any other resources or ideas. No, no, th thank you. That's terrific, Yafa. The, the only thing I would, a couple of things that I would add quickly, uh, Fendel, is that A, um, FOLA is starting to think about training schedule for next year. And we also should be saying as journalists, how can we verify information that works well for librarians and how can we actually learn from how librarians think to maximize and deepen the work that we do? So. 
we we welcome that conversation. And then also, I just wanted to mention, um, I just put in the chat, Peter Newbat Smith is is the hired fact checker at Center for Public Integrity. Sorry, I said CPR, I mean CPI, Center for Public Integrity. And he actually has an undergraduate degree in Middle e medieval history and a law degree, and has been a fact checker there for almost a quarter century. So I'm happy to, if you uh, contact him and just say, I suggested you contact him, I think he would be very helpful for coming from a non-journalism background and now having worked for almost a quarter century uh, with journalists, he might have some some helpful information for you as you're navigating this sounds like relatively new terrain. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it, both of you. No, thank you. Yeah. I've actually just one other thought now, Jeff, that you said it. Um, I'm trying to remember what what her name is. She was the head fact checker at The New Yorker for years, but she wrote a book about fact checking. The New Yorker probably has the most intense fact checking I've ever seen. One of my good friends was a fact checker there for a long time, where they actually have to cross out every single letter of every single word to prove that they fact check something. So like, you know, a name, it's like, you know, if it's Adam, you're crossing out the A, the D, the A, the A, that sort of thing. Um, but The New Yorker, she's written a book about fact checking. And I don't know that she was a journalist by training. Um, she may even more have had a library science background. But to me, that was like the Bible I read in my 20s when I was trying to kind of grasp fact checking. Awesome. Thank you. I'll look that up. All right. Thank you. So why don't why don't we take one more uh, and then Call it. So, did anybody else have a final question, comment, issue, concern that you wanted to uh, raise um, for Yafa? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, oh, what's the, oh yeah, Ajibol is just asking the book title. If you know the book title, Yafa, about yeah, the I will. I have to look it up. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I'm definitely in the, uh, we love nerding out on fact checking among many other topics. So <laughs> imagine if you're all staying on this long, you're, you're like us too. <laughs> so, so thank you uh, so much for joining us. Thank you again.